So first we're gonna have a promo for everyone to see. Well, thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Jeremy Kinney. And thank you for joining us here at the National Mall Building of the Air and Space Museum. We're gonna do what's new in airspace, looking at the airship making. And what we'd like to do is talk about the history of this airship and why it's so important and why we are exploring the remnants of that at the bottom of the ocean. The idea of the rigid airship and what it can do for the U.S. Navy, and we think of the Goodyear blimp over the football stadium. We think about, uh, you know, these airships of a past age like the Hindenburg, you know, that tragic, horrific crash in 1937. But there's also the role of the airship for the U.S. Navy. So that's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about before we get uh, connected with our uh, friend Megan uh, off Point Sur in California. And so the story of the airship begins for the U.S. Navy with Admiral William A. Moffat, who's considered the father of naval aviation. He's the person who's pushing for the idea of the airplane as an offensive weapon for the U.S. Navy. And so we all know about aircraft carriers today, how important they are to the modern defense establishment. And so what is the role of the aircraft carrier? It is to be an offensive weapon, to use airplanes to, do, to protect the power of the United States, but they also have an offensive as well as defensive, as well as reconnaissance or scouting function. And so the idea of the aircraft carrier being the eyes of the fleet on the surface in which aircraft carriers like you see here, the USS Saratoga from uh, the early 1930s, they fulfill that mission, we're very familiar with that. Well, that vision of this global presence of the U.S. Navy in the air also extended to the airship. And so this is the USS Macon. It's one of two Akron-class airships. It's almost 800 feet long. It's 150 feet diameter. Has a crew of about 75 individuals. But its main job for the fleet is to serve as its eyes, to, to cruise out ahead of the fleet. It can cruise about 60 miles per hour at about 10,000 feet and to use the small Sparrowhawk scout aircraft that you see here with the red arrows. And so the, the airship making would carry five airplanes. And you can see the, uh, the Sparrowhawks flying up underneath the airship. And what they're trying to reach is the uh, flying deck and the trapeze for the, uh, the airship. So what you see there is just this little gantry there that the airplane is going to fly up and hook onto. So it's a flying aircraft carrier and, and, the, air, and the airship can carry five of them and it do, it, it's going to scout for the fleet. So it can, and when you're cruising at 60 miles an hour, you're, you're flying a lot faster than a ship on the surface of the ocean. And then the airplanes, the Sparehawks, which we'll take a closer look at, they can fly even faster. So they serve as the eyes of the fleet to extend the power of the fleet and the information the fleet's gathering in so it can you know, uh, cruise as a fleet together. This is a Curtis Sparrowhawk, and so this is one of the five airplanes that would have operated from the Macon. And it's suited for the job. It's only 20 feet long and 25 feet wingspan, carries 230 caliber machine guns, and it's the job of the pilot to hook onto that trapeze and to go up into the airship into the hangar bays. And then they would launch and they'd go search out for the fleet. And so, you know, moving images are always great. Let's take a look at what that actually looked like. Here's a Sparrowhawk, and it's coming up to the trapeze, and it's going to hook onto it. And so what you're seeing is that it's called the Skyhook system. And we'll take a closer look at that. But what that does is it allows the connection between the airplane and the airship. And then we're also going to see it unhook from the airplane. We'll see how dramatic that is. And they're over uh, the East Coast there doing flight trials around 1933, 1934 with these airplanes. And so these are films that are being made to train the pilots on how to fly on and off the flying aircraft carrier. And there goes the Sparrowhawk. So these images of these pilots flying to and from airships, it's pretty fantastical today. We look at it and we go, well, that's pretty curious. But this is a serious business for the U.S. Navy in terms of extending their reach in the eyes of the fleet. This is what the ultimate configuration for a Sparrowhawk would be. They'd actually take the landing gear off the airplane. 
and put a, an extra fuel tank so the, air, so the Sparehawk could cruise 300 miles away from uh, the, in, a, in a radius from the airship. And so the idea of airplanes without landing gear, they can't land on the ground at all, only hook onto the airship and back, that's a pretty futuristic idea for 1935. Now this is the uh, National Air and Space Museum's Curtis Sparrowhawk. It's the sole survivor of about seven made for the U.S. Navy. And as I mentioned, there were two airships, the Akron and the Macon. And so the heavier than the air complement of the Akron and Macon were these Sparrowhawk fighters. But their role was to be reconnaissance and, and patrol. And so you can see this artifact at our Stephen F. udvar Center, which is near the Dulles International Airport. And once again, it's one of those one-of-a-kind aircraft that we have in the, the collection of the Air and Space Museum that you can't see anywhere else. And it is in res restored in the markings of the, one of the aircraft from the USS Macon from 1935. Let's take a closer look at it. You can see the sky hook there. And you know, try to look at these images, and hopefully we'll see something like this when we're looking at the live footage from the EV Nautilus. That's the sky hook, so that's how the airplane actually hooks up to the trapeze. You have the uh, upper wing that's in gull configuration, so just like the wings of a seagull, you can see where the wings join the fuselage, they have that curve to them. It's a very pronounced characteristic of a Curtis airplane. You can see this tube that's the gun sight for the two 30 caliber machine guns. And that is how you aim your machine guns in flight. But it's also a very important characteristic of the airplane, especially when you might be looking for one somewhere in a, in a crash site. And finally, the cockpit. And so this is an open cockpit biplane, very much like a World War I aircraft. So the pilot wears a flight helmet, goggles, has a silk scarf, and these are pretty much the flamboyant dogfighter types that you would think of from the, the First World War on through the 20s and 30s. So this is a very interesting airplane in regards to its construction, how it's used. Uh, but if you're in this airplane, take a look from the cockpit to the forward wing. It's not really easy to see out of the airplane. So as a scout airplane, it may be limited, but it's that small size, a 25 foot by 20 foot footprint that allows it to fit inside the airship. It's also pretty light. And that's a good thing for a lighter than air vehicle to carry. This is the insignia of the heavier than air unit of the USS Macon because they were quickly called the men on the flying trapeze, you know, which is an ode to a, a, a very common song in the late 19th, early 20th century about the famous French air acrobat uh, Leotard. And they take the song, the men on the flying trapeze, and they transfer it to naming these pilots who are flying on and off the Macon and the Akron as well. And just for the symbology, the very large fellow is the airship and the skinny guy is the Sparrowhawk and that, and that representation of that, lo of that insignia. Now this is a view of Macon uh, from inside its airship hangar, which was at Sunnyvale, California, now Moffett Field near Mountain View, California in Silicon Valley, as we know it today. And so to house this airship, you needed a, a structure so large and so tall that it has clouds forming in the top of the hangar bay. You can fit six football fields along the bottom of the, uh, the surface of the hangar to fit this 800 foot long almost 200 foot wide airship inside of it. And it is the one thing that still you can see today if you go to the Bay Area of California, you will see that airship hangar there. And it's being used today as a hangar for airplanes. This is the crew of the Macon in the airship hangar with the Macon. And it's about 75 individuals. And beginning in 1933 when the airship uh, is launched, by the wife of Admiral Moffat, the, you know, the, the pioneer for airships. It is going to go for a two-year career flying for the U.S. Navy on the West Coast as well as the East Coast. And its job is to promote the idea of naval aviation as well as to create the doctrine of the flying aircraft carrier. And so these are the individuals that are doing that. Now in February 1935, the Macon goes out for fleet maneuvers off the West Coast. And it's serving as the eyes of the fleet, and it's launching the Sparehawks to scout for the fleet and fleet exercises. And on its return, it's caught in a storm. And previously, as it cruised across the United States to get to uh, the West Coast, to Moffett Field in Sunnyvale, California, 
they had actually went through a, a big storm that actually weakened the rear of the airship. And they decided, well, we can't repair the airship's fins, the big fins at the rear, until much later when we do a real overhaul and maintenance. And so they're caught in this storm, and it weakens that fin, and it, it basically the rear end of the airship disintegrates. And it causes, since this is a buoyant airship, it, it goes, pitches up really high and goes into the air. And, but then it takes 20 minutes to settle down from 6,000 feet down to sea level at the ocean. And so what occurs is you have no fatalities from the actual crash of the airship. It actually just settles down into the Pacific Ocean. Two members of the crew die as a result of their choosing to go back into the wreckage or jumping out of the airship too early. But in terms of the crash itself, 74 of the 76 crew members of the Macon survive. And just to get into the, the moving picture medium, let's look at the newsreel talking about the story of the crash of the Macon. The framework of the gallant airship Macon, pride of the Navy and queen of the skies, the $4 million dirigible, which since her completion two years ago has been the eyes of the fleet. Today lies a twisted mass of wreckage 250 fathoms deep off the California coast. The giant air fighter crashed into the sea while cruising in war maneuvers. Just at dusk, one of her gas bags burst, then another, then a third. Why? No one knows yet. The great ship became unmanageable. It nosed up several thousand feet and then dropped rapidly despite emergency efforts in the control car. Commander Wiley finally ordered abandoned ship the huge craft which the West Coast so recently hailed lurched into the sea, its officers and men dropping to safety with rubber life rafts as a dozen Navy vessels ablaze with searchlights rushed to save them. Now that newsreel would tell the American people as well as people around the world that the Macon had been lost. And with the loss of the Macon and the loss of the Akron two years before in a thunderstorm off the coast of New Jersey, that is the dream of the large airship, the rigid airship. And so the Navy, who had spent $4 million on the Macon, decides to go with much smaller airships, much like the blimps we know today, like the Goodyear blimp. And so the U.S. Navy uses those blimps all through the, through the early 1960s all through World War II, all through the Cold War. And so the airship stays with the Navy, but the idea of this, one of the largest flying objects ever made by man, goes away in 1935 with the loss of the Macon. And so I think with that short introduction about how the Macon fits into the story of flight, I think we're getting prepared to go to our live feed to the EV Nautilus off the coast of California. And so uh, this is Jeremy, and there's Megan, and uh, how are you guys doing today? Hi, doing just fine today, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, I'm Megan Licklider Munden, and this is my friend Stephanie. And actually, before we get started today, I kind of wanted to ask Stephanie here so that she could explain to us how the EV Nautilus works, what the the sort of core mission is, and exactly what's going on in the ship That'd before be we actually get to the science. So yeah, Stephanie, that... sure. So the EV Nautilus, we've been, uh, this season, we started on April 9th in the Gulf of Mexico. We've done several um, expeditions there, looking at oil seeps and how the deep horizon has affected deep sea corals, um, looking at how methane bubbles are, are moving and affecting the ecosystems. We then transit through the Panama Canal, and we went back to the Galapagos to explore some sites that Dr. Robert Ballard visited in 1977 for hydrothermal vents. And then we headed up the coast to California, and we've been here for the last three and a half, four weeks in what we call the California borderlands. And we are finishing up this expedition with the USS Macon dive. And what we've been seeing here in California are these really low oxygen minimum zones. So where the U.S. is making is, the auction levels are very low. Currently, I think they're in the 20s micromoles per liter, right? They're in the 20s, and actually, um, the oxygen minimum, as I understand it, is 22, 22 and below. And right. right now, the Macon is sitting at about 25. Right. So the oxygen minimum zone, like Megan said, goes from 22 micromoles per liter to about 5 micromoles per liter. Give you a frame of reference, the surface can be anywhere from 200 to 250. So we've been working with scientists from Harvard, Dr. Peter Gerges, and Scripps scientist, um, Dr. Lisa Levin. 
And right now we have on board Dr. Chris German from Woods Hole, and they are all looking at the geology, biology, and chemistry. And so this. So this, this is a brings full. Brings us back today to here. Yeah, and so this. Um, we're doing the USS Macon dive. So this is a great full range. Exp you know, exploration for you guys, but now we're looking at an airship from, you know, the first half of the 20th century. Right. Well, uh, could you... Uh, well, we do this discovery by using what's called remotely operated vehicles. And I thought maybe we could quickly tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, please do. Okay, so the remotely operated vehicles allow us to stay in the water much longer. Um, we can stay indefinitely. There's nothing keeping us from coming up. We have ROV pilots on the deck of the ship in what we call the control van. They work with navigators, scientists, archaeologists, um, video engineers, and they are able to control everything from above and move them around. They can collect samples. I know Megan will tell you about some of the samples they're doing. We can outfit them with different sensors, and we've done some special things for Hercules, our ROV that is doing all the work. Megan's got some special instruments on there. Um, and we're going to be diving today through 8 p.m. Pacific time, so that is 11 East Coast time. That's right. So have you found anything of interest so far in the dive? Okay, so let's go over a bit of the dive, um, Jeremy, and then I will, I will answer whether or not we found anything interesting. We started this morning at 4 a.m., and I, I don't exactly know if you have a TV set up there where you can see the dive as well. They do. They do? Okay, so what we're doing now, beginning at 4 a.m., we had to start with a photo mosaic of the site. The archaeological survey, or goal for this survey is to create a 2D bird's eye view photo mosaic, which we're doing right now. Um, we first had to define the boundaries of the site, the boundaries of this particular field, because the site is broken up into two different fields. The aft portion of the airship we're in right now, and then the forward portion of the airship will go to right after this one. So we defined the boundaries of the field, and now we're just basically doing a, an, an underwater survey pattern called mowing the lawn, which means vertical lines stepping over and then a vertical line stepping over so that we basically cover the entire site with photographs. Post-processing will mean that we can stick together those photographs to form a beautiful map of what the site looks at, or so, excuse me, looks like, and it'll let us know exactly in what relationship so the airplanes are to the rest of the airship, um, in what condition the framework is in, and in what condition the engines are in, basically so that we'd have a context for future study. Uh, we'll do this with both fields of, of sight. One of the things that we've found out so far is that in looking at the previous year's missions, so there was a survey in 1991, 1992, and there was also one in 2005, 2006. In the 2006 survey, we discovered that with a, a lower res photo mosaic that we could see the biplanes and see their relationship to each other but the biplanes were relatively intact and especially biplane number one and two that are sitting very close to each other facing each other those look excellent we see that the level of preservation on those wings we still have fabric on the wings we can see colors on the fabric we can see the Navy insignia, which was the circle with the star and the um, red circle on the interior. We can see all those things still remaining on the aircraft wing, which for an aircraft site, especially when it's 80 years old, is amazing level of preservation. Comparing it to the, to the survey video from now, though, what we've seen is that on biplanes one and two, it still retains that level of preservation, but especially on Biplane number four, we've seen an incredible rate of decay. Um, on biplane number four, we've actually seen that one of the spars has collapsed and all of the ribs have fallen off of that side. It's the starboard side of that aircraft. And um, we're just we're going to have to learn what that means in terms of how the site is acting. Yeah, it's really interesting why one and two are okay and number four is not in the same general area. Right. 
And that's something that we're trying to figure out with this survey. We mentioned before that we have a whole host of meters aboard the ROV with us, one of which is a corrosion potential meter. So it'll actually measure the corrosion rate at the, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's not going to measure the corrosion rate. It measures the corrosion potential, which means that we can discover whether or not the aluminum is actively corroding or passively corroding. And just by visuals, it looks like it's actively corroding on biplane number four. But we can confirm that by taking this meter and taking readings from the aircraft rib that we see on it at depth. What we're also going to do um, during this survey is actually recover one of the airship frame pieces and compare it to one that we brought up 25 years ago. So we'll not only have a visual survey of how the uh, site looked over a span of 25 years, we'll actually have a chemical timeline of an airship rib or frame piece from 1991 to 2015. So that's a difference of 25 years extra on the seafloor that this frame piece will have. So it's going to be really interesting to look at that one as it comes up and as it goes through conservation. And um, in terms of National Air and Space Museum, Jeremy, we are talking to and hopefully will be able to, to donate the piece and have it be on display there at National Air and Space Museum after it's conserved. Okay, and I think that would be a, a great possibility, especially, I mean, there's, it's a piece of a airship, but it's also the, the study of how things age, and especially in an environment like the, the crash site of the Macon. Right. Well, we haven't uh, seen any so images. So one of the other things that we're doing, sorry to interrupt. No problem. Please go ahead. I'll wait for you. Yeah, we have that three second delay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start. Um, one of the other things that we're doing as well as creating this 2D photo mosaic is we have the really wonderful opportunity to take video in order to create a 3D model of the two biplanes that are closest together. Um, when I say 3D model, I mean that in, in, instead of the 2D photo mosaic where we see a bird's eye view of what we're looking at, a 3D model will be able to see the side of the fuselage of the aircraft, will be able to see inside the wings, um, under surfaces and in and around, and the 3D model will allow us to physically manipulate what we want to see around an axis that we can then understand it That's so really much cool. better. That's great because it sounds like it's getting more in depth of what you can actually see on the floor rather than just getting those, those images. Absolutely. So we're probably at this point able to start taking questions if you wanted to. Sure, I'd be glad to uh, see if there are any questions in our audience here. And we'll, uh, if anyone does have a question, come up to the front to the microphone and, and feel free to, uh, to ask. As we're having people come up, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, what is the, sure. the status of the Macon site? It's a National Historic Place, and it's in a marine sanctuary. Is there, one of the common questions I've had about it is, is it, is it the intention to salvage the airship and the airplanes? All right, so the site itself, the airship wreck site and all of the biplanes, they are inside the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which means that the land that they rest upon is overseen by NOAA um, National Marine Sanctuary's program. The site itself, or sorry, excuse me, the wreck site and the associated biplanes are still within the jurisdiction of the U.S. Navy, so they are administered by the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command, and they're actually under the protection of the Sunken Military Craft Act as well, which protects all military craft, either airship, airplanes, um, or ships in U.S. waters and abroad. Um, it is also, as of 2010, 
a site listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So all of these uh, protection uh, agencies, of, agencies yeah. combined will give it a layover where it, we had to go through a permitting process to, um, to actually work on the site and sure. to take one of those samples. There are no plans either now in the future to recover anything else off the wreck, especially anything big. Um, the way that the biplanes look right now, they're extremely, extremely fragile, and I think that any yeah. attempts to recover them would just end in disaster. They would, we would get basically a heap of, of airship, or, or sorry, aircraft aluminum and not much else. Yeah, because unlike a World War II airplane that's pretty rugged, uh, these are pretty diminutive airplanes, and they're pretty fragile. And so the idea is to, they're, they're safe where they're at. You know? That's absolutely correct, yes. Mm -hmm. These aircraft had fabric skin um, over, over the fuselage and the wings. Um, they had very fragile duralumin metal uh, structural parts, which is a different alloy than aircraft aluminum is made from today. And so, especially with them being down for 80 years, their, their level of preservation, or sorry, excuse me, preservation is good, but it's not good enough to where we can recover one. We're also having a little issue with the sediment as well. The sediment is very, a lot of flocculence is going on, and so it, it would be really touchy to try to do anything down there, just even with the thrusters of the ROVs, um, it would kicking up sediment, uh, messing up our visibility, which would make it really hard to do any work with a uh, very, very little visibility. Yeah, you might mess something up. Has the visibility gotten a little better? A little bit. Do we have any questions from the audience? Actually, we have an online question. Does the wreckage move over time because of ocean currents? No, we're not finding that it does move over time with ocean currents. Um, the only thing that we're discovering that might be current affected is the position of the aircraft in relation to their deterioration levels. So we're seeing that biplane number four is definitely the one that's corroding the fastest, or sorry, decaying the fastest. We don't know about corrosion rates yet. Biplanes one and two, the, the parts that are facing the north and sort of protected are the parts that look better. Um, the parts that face the south are, they don't look as good. So we might see some work of the current there, but we still just really don't know without doing surveys like this to measure any effects that we see. And we are about 430 meters deep, which we're kind of beneath that point where we start to see strong impacts of surface currents. Right. Um, as you move down, the currents will lose their energy due to friction. And so it's not necessarily as strong as it would be at the surface either. Right. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, what type of sea and aquatic life have you found in and around the wreckage? Um, so we're seeing, this is an auction minimum zone, but luck, or it's on just the cusp of it. So we are still seeing quite a bit of fish, but these are fish that we usually see in these areas with the lower oxygen. So things like, um, seen some soles, we've seen um, a few cat sharks, which are smaller sharks about this big. We've seen um, sable fish, thorny heads. Um, not at this site, but we've been seeing a lot of octopus of different kinds. My favorite, the Dumbo octopus. Dumbo octopus. We also will see some brittle stars, sea stars. We've seen quite a bit of holothurians, which are related to the sea stars. They're echinoderms as well. Um, they're commonly known as sea cucumbers. And of course, lots of jellies and then Siphonophores. Siphonophores are in the Cnidarian phylum. They are not jellyfish. They are actually hydrozoans. They are colonial organisms where each each organism is an individual, but they work together as a whole. And those unfortunately get tangled on Hercules, and they sting and have nematocysts, and we have to put gloves on to clean them. So there is still quite an abundance of life here. Are there any other questions?
Have divers ever visited the wreckage? No, um, divers have never visited this wreckage because it's far too deep. Um, the recreational dive limit is around about 100 feet for normal diving limits, and people have dove or dove gone, fa gone, gone farther, farther than that, about maybe 200, 250, yes, 300 yeah. feet. Um, but this site is at 1,450 feet. So you cannot visit the site except for with an ROV like this or with a submersible. The thing about using a submersible though is that you wouldn't be able to stay down very long. So Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, they have a couple submersibles. Um, there's other organizations that do as well. And they usually dive um, within certain limits. Eight to five is all they can do because you have people in the submersible and they have to eat, they've got to go to the bathroom. And so that's a big restraint. And so having the ROVs down allows us to go down from 4 a.m. this morning to 8 p.m. Right. We can stay down as long as we want. We could stay down longer if we really you know, needed to. Um, and we just switch out the crews every four hours. And so it works out a lot better. You can actually get a lot more done um, for what this site is requiring. We do have a question from the audience. Please go ahead, sir. Have you seen anything like um, any uniform badges or any like old-fashioned things, personal things to be exact, that the military people would? No. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, we haven't seen any personal effects on this wreck site. Um, the sediment level over the past 80 years has been so much so that we're getting a, a very fine layer over everything, and that would cover up small finds like that um, from view. We couldn't manage to see them. There were only two people aboard the vessel who died, um, so we wouldn't be seeing much in terms of personal effects except for the things that people left on side the ship. Um, fabric, since this was the type of, of wreck site where the outer aluminum, or excuse me, the outer aluminum dope skin would have deteriorated and we don't see much of the inner gas bags either, the site itself is very open on the seafloor. And so for fabric, personal fabric and personal effects to survive, they would have to be extremely hardy. And that's not usually what we see in association with open water shipwrecks. They usually have to be inside of something or leather or um, safe from, safe from uh, environment and marine biology too. And the sedimentation rate, not sure what it is for this area, but where we were yesterday, which is not too far away, it was actually a little bit higher than we normally would expect, and it was two millimeters per year. And that doesn't sound like that much, but you can imagine over time that does is going to have an impact. Online. We have an online question. How is the ROV controlled? So the ROV, we actually work with, in a, with two ROVs. We find that having this two ROV system works better. What that means is we have the Evian Nautilus at the top. We have our second right ROV, ROV tethered with optical cords and electrical cords called Argus. Argus sits in the middle of the, of the bottom ROV, which is Hercules. And Argus, what it does is shines lights on and also provides stabilization because Hercules is gonna to need to be able to do some fine movement here, um, taking the pictures for the uh, photo mosaic, but also when it goes to, to use your bathy core and when it goes to, um, to grab the aluminum sample, if the ship in the Hercules didn't have Argus, then the ship would be pulling Hercules kind of like, some, like you walking a dog on a leash. So Argus is really heavy and provides a stabilization so that doesn't happen. Then we have another tether with all our optical cords and electrical cords leading down to Hercules. And Hercules then can, has two arms, has its right hand, which is very good at doing fine movements. These movements are all controlled by two pilots that work together to work for both Argus and Hercules. Um, and they have joysticks and buttons they can use. Um, and then there is a second hand, the left hand, which is the power hand, can pick up a lot of uh, heavy lifting, um, we don't use it as often because usually we're doing fine, detailed movements. 
We have bio boxes, which is where the aluminum is going to be, be stashed. We also can collect water samples, which we won't be doing this time. Um, and we can collect sediment cores, which we also won't be doing either, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Uh, are any images uh, currently available to show the audience of the wreckage or the aircraft? From this survey, nothing is available yet, primarily because we've only been getting it in the last six hours. Um, <laughs> nothing is really up yet because it's all still on our computer system that we're currently working with right now. But images are available from the 2006 survey if you basically Google anything USS Macon or they're available from the NOAA website. It's um, sanctuaries slash Macon, I think. Um, and you can also Google historic images and they'll show you, especially the airship itself, the structural elements of the airship, one of which we're picking up, the biplanes, the trapeze system, and I'm sure you just saw some of that in Jeremy's presentation. Um, but images of the biplanes underwater from the 2006 survey are available online and from the NOAA website. And we do have some of those images as a PowerPoint. I don't know if that can be brought up. I could just kind of, we could use that as a reference if we wanted to look at that. Um, Wait, Jeremy, we'll go to online and then we'll bring up the PowerPoint. But as we try that, we'll have an online question. How does the underwater wreckage of an airship compare to that of a boat? Um, okay, so this airship site is actually, I would compare it to the Titanic site a little bit. How so? Because especially in the movie, which we know is not <laughs> in, incredibly accurate, but the Titanic supposedly sank in at an altitude um, that was sort of like this. As it did that, it broke apart on the surface. Now, the same thing happened to the USS Macon. Um, it broke apart, the aft end settled in, in pretty much a circular shape. It's a little like an accordion on the bottom. And the front section settled um, over top of the control cab a little bit of ways. It's not as far away as the Titanic. Um, but I think that that's really where the, the sort of comparison ends, except for ancient shipwrecks. So in modern shipwrecks, what you find is that the, the ship itself, especially if it's iron hulled, is, is still pretty intact, unless it's been blown up right. in some way but it's still pretty intact and sitting on the seafloor. We see that over and over and over again. Um, it's still a ship shape. You can see that it was a ship. You can see things on it, and you can, you can pretty much look what you're looking for. In ancient ships from wood, what we normally see is that they leave the imprint of their cargo. So they leave an imprint of whatever they were carrying in the shape of their ship. Oh, wow. Um, so normally what we find on amphora sites is that they're shaped like an oblong with a little bit wider in the middle of amphora. This airship site is similar to that in the fact that wow. because of the structure was um, a, a cotton, it was a, a doped cotton, that has all disintegrated and left the, the framework. So what that framework did, especially as it was uh, sinking and flooding and it was crumpling and sort of uh, collapsing in on itself and getting wrenched apart, but it still has the vague outline shape of what the airship used to look like. And what we find at the wreck site is everything that was in the interior. So we're finding the biplanes, the fuel tanks, the structural elements, the Maybach engines. Um, we're finding pieces like uh, the plastic ware that they used to have to eat off of in oh, the wow. galley. Stoves um, from the galley. We're finding all kinds of incredible things that were on the interior of the airship. And they look uh, like they would, basically, how they would abort it. That will conclude our question and answer period, but uh, we do have a few images from the 2005-2006 expedition to the Macon. And what I'll do is we'll bring those up, and then we'll have um, Megan and Stephanie 
uh, I'll describe it and maybe they can speak to it a little bit. Um, so the first image is of the, I think it's, it's two sparrowhawks actually on the ocean floor. Uh, and so it's you know, it, it describing what the condition is, and I guess, and how you guys described it, there's more sediment on the uh, aircraft now and the, and the rest of the airship since 2005, 2006? Um, I would say that there's a little more sediment on the actual sea floor. The aircraft themselves don't have enough surface space to really carry a bunch of sediment, so it falls through the exposed rib structure and onto the seafloor itself. Um, but we're seeing a little bit more sediment covering things that are on the seafloor. And we just had one more question come in, so we're going to address that and then we'll get back to maybe some more images. Jeremy, can you read it? Yeah. I'm going to read the question. Is there anything in the gondola of the Macon that could be preserved? Oh, that's a really good question. And um, unfortunately, we haven't found the gondola yet because the way that the airship broke, um, the airship broke at its forward half, uh, its forward actually two thirds, right in front of the hangar. So everything from this portion downwards fell in a very neat accordion that sort of lifted uh, the biplanes up. The gondola was at the bottom part of the forward third of the airship, which sort of just settled exactly how it was. It didn't fall over an accordion because the gondola would be on the side. It sort of settled on top of the gondola. We're fairly certain that this is in fact what happened given the, the relief of the wreck site, the fact that it's in a mound and the fact that we haven't found the gondola. So we're pretty sure that it's underneath the wreck site that we see above. And unfortunately, we haven't really needed to disturb this wreck site. We wouldn't disturb it enough to go and find the gondola. Um, but yes, I guarantee that there would be some pretty nice artifacts in there, some very, very um, diagnostic items, but we can't get to it. That's unfortunate, but it is part of the, the nature of the site and what you have to deal with underwater archaeology. If we could look at just a couple more images right. uh, taken from the earlier expedition, I wanted to ask about uh, we're looking at an image of the cockpit with the gun sight and the uh, upper wing, the gull wing. And do you think eventually right. the uh, aircraft will just be filled? I mean, they'll, they'll just disappear in terms of sediment or decay or what's the biggest threat? Well, you know, one of the... Um one of the things about the biplanes is that they're all deteriorating individually. So on biplane number three, for instance, it's already sort of crushed onto the seafloor and you can't see inside of it to the, to the fuselage that's going on. And um, the uh, ribs are kind of falling down and the spars are doing their thing. But on aircraft number four, as the aircraft has deteriorated and the, the rear spar has fallen down. What we can see, since the ribs are no longer there and it doesn't have any um, gunk in the interior there, is we can actually see side. the side of the fuselage and we can see that it still has fabric on there. So the, the sort of non-matching deterioration means that we really don't know what it's going to mean for the site in the future. Eventually, yes, the site will deteriorate past recognition, but that could be, you know, 500 years from now. Um, it could be 100 years from now. The information that we'll get from the corrosion studies that we're doing on this survey will help us determine that, and it'll also help us determine if we can go back and look at it um, sooner rather than later, or if we're safe to do that. <clears throat> but what we probably see 
are that biplanes one and two are going to be the most well preserved for the longest amount of time. And on those, we can see uh, diagnostic things like the fuselage. We can see a little tiny bit of a tail section on number one. And then we can see a little bit of the um, engine shutters and the propeller on biplane number one as well. So it's very interesting stuff. I have a question. Is this normal for a site to have such variation in the way things are breaking down? Because it seems very such a very extreme difference between these planes. And is that normal? Well, on aircraft sites, and especially on aluminum sites, is normally we get single deposition sites. And normally that's, the, that's been the only thing that's been um, studied. So as we start to discover and study more battlefield sites, especially like World War II sites, so this predates World War II, um, but especially as we study more sites, we'll be able to see if we can track preferential corrosion and, um, and the, the varying decay rates. But short answer is right now we don't understand, and that's one of the reasons why we're yeah, doing... so much to find out, not just why, this, why some of the planes are so well preserved after 80 years, but why are we seeing such variation. It's really, Correct. really fascinating. Yeah. It's an amazing legacy of the uh, making, and we're really just in awe of the work that you guys are doing uh, to document it. And we're looking forward to seeing what may develop from seeing more pictures and seeing the, the update from uh, your expedition. So we'd like to thank uh, Megan and Stephanie uh, from the EV Nautilus. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. And uh, this will conclude our program, What's New in Aerospace. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Boeing. We'd like to thank the crew of the EV Nautilus. And we'd like to thank NOAA, especially for documenting this such impressive, impressive legacy of uh, the 1930s in naval aviation. And Jeremy? Yes. Please go ahead. And Jeremy, we'd like to make sure to invite everyone to log on to nautiluslive.org. Uh, we will be diving through 11 p.m. tonight. You can watch live as Megan is at the helm, literally commanding what's happening. You can also chat in questions beneath the video. You'll see a chat box. Um, it will actually be me that's answering them, and I will feed them to Megan. So if you have more questions later on that you're thinking on the drive home, um, come back um, later, and you can ask those questions. Absolutely. I think after I put my daughter to bed tonight, I will do that. And that's nautiluslive.org. Yeah. Uh, so nautilus.org. <laughs> nautiluslive.org. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you guys have a great... No, uh, nautiluslive.org. Thank you. And so this concludes our program, and hope you enjoyed it, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day at the museum. Thank you.